The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12. Idaho Democrats now have 12 seats in the state Senate. If they lose only one on November 2nd and John Evans remains governor, Democrats won't be able to sustain his veto. Tonight, Republican and Democratic prospects in three key races. Good evening. Two years ago, Idaho Democrats were talking seriously about taking control of the state Senate. Of course, they didn't. They were caught in a Republican sweep that left just a dozen Democrats in the state Senate. It came close to being a disaster for Idaho Democrats, but even with just 12 votes, they discovered that if they stayed together, which they did most of the time, they could sustain a gubernatorial veto. On at least a couple of important occasions, just exactly that happened. There is no talk on the part of Democrats this year of gaining control of the state Senate. Rather, Democrats would be almost happy to hold on to what they have, and that will be difficult. For one thing, their leader, Boise Democrat Ron Twilliger, is not seeking re-election, and his important Senate seat is very much up for grabs. Additionally, legislative reapportionment has changed some districts, particularly in northern and eastern Idaho, so that some Democrats and at least a few Republicans are not as safe as they once might have been. Tonight, we examine three particularly significant and close state Senate contests. We have three reports from Coeur d'Alene, Pocatello, and Boise. We begin tonight with the Senate race in Boise's Legislative District 17. It involves a curious mixture of big money, impressive candidates, and some real issues. Both Democrats and Republicans consider the area a swing district. It could easily fall either way. One need only look at the political yard signs that have sprouted along fashionable Harrison Boulevard in Boise's North End to know that state Senate politics is serious stuff here. Since 1977, Democrat Ron Twilliger has represented this district and survived as the only Ada County Democrat now in the state legislature. Twilliger's departure from District 17 politics has created a mad scramble to replace him. Both parties are eager to gather in the seat. The eagerness has spawned the most expensive legislative race in the history of the state. It also might be one of the closest. The Democratic candidate, Gail Bray, has raised more money than any Democrat ever has for a legislative race, nearly $20,000. The Republican, Dean Sorensen, is spending even more, over $26,000, nearly $12,000 of his own money. Sorensen now has the distinction of spending more for a legislative race than anyone ever has before in Idaho. And the candidates are a contrast. Bray, 34 years old, has a master's in political science and has lobbied the legislature for the League of Women Voters. Sorensen, 42 years old, is a very successful surgeon, a relative political newcomer. And on the issues, well, they disagree a lot. Well, I think the issues are the difference philosophically between myself and my opponent. Uh, I think that Gail is a more liberal individual who suggested a number of new social programs, which I believe all have a significant fiscal note attached. I think I'm more conservative in that nature. I'm interested in balancing the budget and getting Idaho people back to work. And I think that the economy is the prime consideration in this campaign as far as our differences are concerned. Well, I don't, you know, he, I've heard him say that before. Uh, I do not consider myself liberal. I have worked at the legislature over the past six years on Republican issues and on Democratic issues. And I've worked against Democratic and Republican issues as well. They have, they have uh, spanned a range of, you know, if you wanted to call them conservative to liberal issues, and I have never considered myself in, pegged in any, any one of those holes. I don't believe other people have perceived me that way. I've been able to get consensus from both Republicans and Democrats on a wide range of issues and help those laws pass at the, at the legislature. I think if I was, if I was in fact a, a person who was not moderate, as my opponent would like to say I, I am not, uh, I wouldn't have been able to have the successes that I have had at the legislature in uh, helping to draft legislation and, and working for and against particular pieces of legislation. The state's financial difficulties have been at the center of the Bray Sorensen contest. And I think that we're probably in a you know, worse state of affairs than most people realize, and I'm sure you know that. 
Um, the budget this year was projected, uh, or rather I should say that the governor submitted a budget of $477 million and the legislature appropriated uh, or conceived that the budget would be about 460 and the best of estimates show that it's going to come in around 410 so there's going to be a $50 million deficit. This is uh, aside from the fact that we still haven't paid for some of last year's debts. And so I think that our major emphasis has to be on getting that budget balanced. And probably I would foresee a special session of the legislature in December to address this problem. I think most people would like to see us start out by streamlining government a little bit, reallocation of funds to cut this down. But if under the best of efforts this doesn't work, there's going to have to be some sort of uh, additional revenues. If this occurs, I would favor probably a temporary 1% increase in the sales tax. And the reason I say temporary is because when Idaho is back to work and people have their jobs back and they're not on welfare or unemployment, then we're going to have the revenues that we projected a year ago. Uh, and I think that if you analyze the issue that a 1% increase in sales tax for one year would raise $50 million, which is exactly what our deficit would be. And I would support this only if we did our best to cut all the fat out of government and streamlined everything that we saw possible and uh, reallocated funds to the best of our ability. And if we still came up with that $50 million, then, that, then I think that we would have to do something to raise revenues. And I have leveled with the voters on that, that we are going to need to address that problem quickly with a quick source of revenue. Uh, unless we want to have drastic cuts in our education system for this fiscal year. How do we get that revenue if we in fact decide that we need it? Well, uh, the easiest way is a sales tax increase, although that's not the way that I, easiest to administer and quickest to put in place. I would only support a sales tax increase after looking at as many e increased efficiencies and cuts in state government as we possibly could within that uh, January to March period of the legislative session. But uh, if we did not find ample money there, and I doubt that we can with all of the shortfall that we're looking at in, in revenue to the state, uh, the, the sales tax, although easy to administer, is a very regressive tax, and it hits those with the, on fixed incomes hardest. And so I would, I would be reticent to look to that as the, my first choice. Uh, rather, I would like to look at expanding the sales tax base. Right now, 63% of the sales in Idaho are exempted from the sales tax and we raise 146 billion dollars with the three percent uh, that we now levy on the 33 37 percent of sales that are taxed I think we can we can uh, look to those exemptions why they were uh, secured in the first place their their present purpose and need and eliminate some of those exemptions and increase the, the revenue from the sales tax to the state both candidates say they will push for new, tougher laws dealing with drunken driving. Sorensen would raise the legal drinking age. Well, I think, first of all, we need to uh, raise the drinking age from 19 to 21. Uh, it's been shown that the biggest killer between ages 16 and 24 are alcohol-related accidents, and so I think this is a step in the right direction. I think we need to raise our conviction rate from around 30 percent up to 90 percent, and I think the illegal per se, which would provide more proof for drunk driving convictions is an essential. Um, I also think that we need to establish what is the proper blood alcohol level and to increase the fines. Uh, it's important, I think, that we have some sort of mandatory jail sentence, and I would favor that on the second but not the first offense. The only way I would consider raising the drinking age is if the data conclusively showed that the, the age of a driver uh, who was drinking was directly linked to the fatality, the numbers of fatalities in that age range. I think if the drinking age was raised, it would need to be done in one year increments so that those who are presently legal uh, would not lose that legality as a, because of a law passed in the Idaho legislature next year. Those who are 19 now, uh, if it went up in one year increments, would remain legal until they were 21 and then everyone under 21 would not be able to imbibe. I believe very strongly in a minimum mandatory sentence Bray says she'll be a full-time senator, using her experience as a lobbyist to become effective immediately. Bray's full-time slogan is a not-so-thinly-veiled reminder that Sorensen will be balancing both his medical practice and his political career. He says he can do that. How are you going about winning this election? Well, I think uh, the major thing that I've done is to, uh, I've gone to every precinct in this district and I've uh, passed out 11,000 pamphlets at this point in time, and I think that my emphasis has been on personal contact. 
In the primary, it was entirely different. I needed name identification. And I spent the majority of my campaign finances on, on the primary against four tough, qualified opponents. In the general election, I focused in on personal contact on a one-to-one -one level with people of the district. And I've spent several hours a day doing this for the last six weeks. And that's how I intend to win the election. We've been doing this for eight months now. And our theory was that we needed to go to as many doors as we possibly could. And for eight months, I've been going to doors and visiting with people. And I have seen over 6,000 people in this district. And uh, that takes time. It takes time away from other endeavors. But it, it has been rewarding beyond belief. There is, there is no way either my opponent or myself can lose from this involvement. It has been something that has expanded each of our horizons and will go on, I think, to bless each one of us uh, through whatever we do in the future. The reapportionment factor is an unknown quantity in District 17. The district did change slightly this year. Whether it is enough to affect the outcome one way or another is uncertain. Most capital city political watchers rate the Bray Sorensen contest as a virtual toss-up. Both candidates are into heavy last-minute radio, television, and newspaper advertising blitzes. An equally competitive race is in the home stretch in the Pocatello area where a Democratic incumbent state senator is facing a stiff challenge from a man who has been one of the most conservative members of the Idaho House of Representatives. As Paula Whistle reports, that campaign has also featured the charge of dirty politics. Every two years in mid-October, the Idaho State University homecoming parade in Pocatello becomes something of a political parade as well. And this year was no exception. Among those smiling and waving for the crowds and cameras were the two candidates in a race for the District 35 state Senate seat. The incumbent is Democrat Charles, or Chick, Bilyeu. He's held the seat for 12 years and serves on the Finance and Transportation Committees in the Senate. Until this year, when he retired, Bilyeu was a professor of speech and drama at Idaho State University and considers himself a leader in the area of funding for education. Trying to defeat Bilyeu is the current representative from District 35, Republican Rusty Barlow. Barlow is serving his third term in the House, where he sits on the Revenue and Taxation and Printing Committees. During his tenure, he has championed such causes as the raising of the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit and not requiring the licensing of daycare centers. Barlow says he could better represent the voters of District 35. This district is one of contrasts. It includes the newer subdivisions and tract homes of Pocatello and Chubbuck, as well as the farming communities surrounding American Falls and Aberdeen. It also takes in the voting district of the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. The electorate is also divergent. After all, last election they did vote in both Democrat Chick Bilyeu and Republican Rusty Barlow. Reapportionment has affected this district some. It now takes in less of traditionally Democratic Pocatello. And as for the main issue in this Senate race. But I think the main issues in my particular campaign is the contrast between my opponent and myself and our political philosophies. On one hand, uh, my opponent uh, campaigns uh, as a conservative, but his voting record is, is very liberal. And uh, when I decided to run in the, in the very beginning, he was the first person I went to. And I told him then that uh, I would be talking about his record. So I suppose our records are the main issue in our political philosophies. I am a conservative Democrat. I don't think anybody else has ever called me a liberal except my opponent. And of course, uh, he'd like to be the senator. He was the representative, which was a nice, good official job of the state of Idaho, but he wants to be the senator. I am the senator, and he has to find something to say, so if he calls me liberal and can make some people believe that I'm liberal, well, that's an advantage for him. But I am not a liberal. I am a moderate, very moderate. Mr. Barlow, you say that your opponent's voting record is too liberal. Can you give me some specifics? Okay, I've talked about the insanity plea. Uh, that bill passed with overwhelming majority in the House and in the Senate. Uh, that did away with the insanity cop-out. Uh, uh, my opponent, Mr. Bilyeu, voted against removing the insanity plea. Uh, another bill that I've talked about is a bill that would have tightened the sale of alcohol and tobacco, uh, stiffened the penalties for those that sell alcohol and tobacco to minors. 
Uh, that bill was was in in the House of Representatives. Patty McDermott voted for the bill. Ralph Lacey voted for the bill. And I think it passed almost unanimously. It was even signed by the governor, and yet uh, my opponent, Mr. Billu, voted against it. And Rusty Barlow has emphasized such issues in an extensive radio campaign. This is Rusty Barlow. When I voted to support voluntary school prayer and to crack down on selling alcohol to minors, I had your children in mind. And when I voted to put a constitutional limit on inflationary state spending, I had your grocery bill in mind. It's not hard to vote the way I believe you'd want me to, because I've got a family of my own. As senator, I'll continue to vote for your family and mine. But according to Democrat Billu, the main issues have not been addressed in this race. Well, I think, I think the tenure of his uh, campaign is that he is attacking me on every little issue, not issue, he's not talking to the issues, uh, on every little bill that he thinks uh, uh, he can find that I perhaps have, in somebody's opinion, uh, voted wrong on. Take a bill like the one to propose a constitutional amendment to balance the federal budget. All right, I voted against that. But the rationale was very important. The reasons why I voted against it were very important. I believe in the principle of a balanced budget. However, I'm not willing, as many of the rest of them were, to open up our entire Constitution to put on an amendment that we must have a balanced budget. There is another method of, of amending the, uh, the United States Constitution, and that's by having a Congress present it to the various legislatures. That's the way all the rest of the amendments that we've ever had have been presented and passed. And that's the regular route. But to open up the entire Constitution, lay the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, the press, and freedom of religion on the line, to let somebody change those, or the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, gun control, put those things on the open block and let, let anybody who could get to the convention vote on those things again? No, sir, I would not vote on that again. It's 47 degrees out of the Pocatello Airport. I got Bob Lumen from 1973 coming up next. Coalition is a group of concerned citizens. We are particularly concerned about the recent radio announcements being broadcast by Jim Johnston, Myron Jones, and Rusty Barlow, all right-wing Republican candidates for the state Senate. We believe that the paid political announcement this was one of a series of radio commercials run recently on Pocatello radio stations by an independent group calling itself the Citizens Coalition. The ads are meant to counter the campaigns of Barlow and other Republican Senate candidates running against Democratic incumbent. An ethical and honest campaign without these smear tactics. Curtail the use of these type of tactics. Tell the public the whole truth on all issues and by so doing not tarnish themselves with dirty politics. Paid for by Citizens Crisis Coalition. Well, actually, the coalition is nothing more than a front for the Democratic Party. Uh, I'd like to see our campaign, I mean, our opponents come out and point out what's false instead of having uh, someone run interference for them. Uh, that doesn't bother me. Uh, I could go start up a group if I wanted and come out and say whatever I wanted them to say, too. And I think basically that's what's happened. If, if our opponents are upset about what we're saying, let's let our opponents come out and defend their records and they haven't been doing that. They've been afraid to come out and defend their records, and I'd certainly be afraid if I had a record like they have. In regards to the coalition coming out and uh, criticizing <coughs> the Republican candidates, your opponent has said, well, it's really just a front organization for the Democrats. Why don't the Democrats come out themselves? Why do they have to hide behind this group? I think that our, uh, our concerted effort and in our deliberations, we decided that we would not get down in the mud and uh, contest these picayunish things that they're talking about because when you get down in there, you can't help but get mud on yourselves. We decided we'd stay above uh, the low road. I started running for the Idaho State Senate in 1962. I was defeated in 62 in the primary. In 64, I won the primary and I was defeated in the general election. So it took me three times, I had to run three times before I ever won a seat in the Idaho Senate. I never once attacked the individual that was in there. I ran on a positive campaign for the seat, for the Senate seat. Do you think it's been a clean campaign? It's been a very clean campaign. Uh, I've talked about the issues. Uh, I've stuck strictly to the issues and kept personality out of it. 
And uh, if anybody says anything to the contrary, uh, what I'm talking about is my opponent's record. And if they don't feel that's clean, then that's uh, not my problem. There is one thing the candidates agree on, that this will be a close election. Bill U concedes he has lost some strength through reapportionment. Last election, he won by 600 votes, but lost in both Power and Bingham counties. In this election, he'll be more dependent on those traditionally Republican communities. As Paula indicated, there are at least a couple of other Democrats in the Pocatello area, Bert Marley and Gary Gould, who are also facing tough re-election battles. One of the few districts in the state where a Democrat is given a chance to knock off an incumbent Republican state senator is in District 3, the Coeur d'Alene area. It is, as Mark Krein reports, a district that has been in heavily involved in economic issues. The most interesting legislative races this year in northern Idaho concerns District 3 of Kootenai County. It will be a difficult choice for District 3 voters because Republican incumbent Terry Sverdston and former Democratic State Senator Art Manley are both well qualified and experienced in legislative practices. And like many campaigns that are this close, come election day it may come down to the undecided vote that makes the difference. Democratic candidate Art Manley is well known so. in Kootenai County for his political activity. He served in the House of Representatives from 1964 to 1966. Manley then turned his interest towards the legislature from 1966 to 1972. He was defeated for one term and then voted back into office in 1974 and stayed there until 1980. But that was all back in the old district too. Because of population shifts and a reapportionment of districts, Manley is now in District 3, which is under the present leadership of first-term Senator Terry Sverdston. And Sverdston feels that District 3 will be better served by a less liberal type of government. Because I believe that the majority of people in Kootenai County are very conservative people and my voting record will prove that I have been a much more conservative voice for North Idaho than my opponent has ever been. I'm going to do my very best to encourage the banking community to invest more dollars within our community around Coeur d'Alene. It's a well-known fact that banks can invest or, or they can loan up to 80 percent of their deposits. It's also known that they loan about 40 percent of their deposits in the local area and then ship the other deposits to the home office and invest them far afield. I will put on as much pressure as I know how, even if it takes legislation, to encourage more investing in the local communities and thus to stimulate business right here at home. I will support an extension of unemployment compensation benefits for those people whose benefits have been exhausted. I think that's very necessary. Uh, as far as, as the, the big picture, what we're going to be able to do to get industry back on its feet and get business back in uh, full swing and that sort of thing, uh, I don't think it's going to happen until interest rates nationally come down uh, to a level with which we can work. And I'm in the real estate business and housing, and I know what it has done to us. And what it's done to us is the same to the timber industry and, and all the other industries throughout this part of the state. So that's the key, that interest rates have to come down. But in addition to that, we can do some things at the local level, mostly working with the counties and the cities, uh, try to provide uh, a place for industry to locate the right kind of industry, uh, provide facilities for them, sewer, uh, other utility, and uh, of course provide good educational climate, which they uh, rightly feel is very essential if, if uh, their employees are going to come here and if they're going to come here. Uh, those things we haven't done as much as we should have. Otherwise, the business climate is good in Idaho. We have a proposal for industrial revenue bonds on the ballot. I certainly support that. Uh, we have a good tax climate for business, and uh, I think business is ready to go if we can just provide uh, a little bit of encouragement. Mostly it's going to be have at the national level. Uh, the primary issue are not the do-good type things uh, to protect this, protect that, and more government. The main issues are jobs, and we have to improve the business climate. We have to reduce government restrictions and I'm in favor of those, and I think I can offer a tremendous amount of help to North Idaho in those areas. The issues, obviously, that any incumbent faces is the state of the economy and the state of unemployment and this sort of thing. And whether right or wrong, uh, people I have found blame those in office for whatever goes wrong. They don't give them as often uh, credit as they do blame, and uh, it isn't all deserved, but nevertheless, I don't see anything uh, on the part of the legislature that has occurred in the last couple of years that has been directly uh, aimed at recognizing the problem or doing anything about it. 
I have no desire to be a senator for year after year after year. The status of it means nothing at all. I have a business to run, but I'm also concerned about the direction state government is going. Three years ago, I was no more a politician than you are. And yet I became concerned, tried to find someone else to run for the office, could not, and became involved myself. I will dedicate myself to working 17, 18 hours a day in reading and researching legislation. And after a few years, I'll let someone else have the job. I think that uh, if I uh, am back there, perhaps I could uh, uh, do even more this time. The last time uh, I feel uh, that my, my loss was, my race was a close one, I lost. And I think uh, the loss could be attributed to the coattail effect of the Reagan administration and the unpopularity in Idaho of the Carter administration. We don't have that problem this time, so it'll be more of a clean cut race. On the other hand, I, I, ha I find as I go door to door that there is uh, quite a lot of dissatisfaction with the national administration. And so uh, that coattail effect may work in reverse a little bit this year. At least I won't have to fight the national administration in this race for office. I think it will boil down, Mark, to the undecided vote. And that's too bad because there isn't that much disharmony in northern Idaho. But uh, I believe that uh, Republicans will tend to vote Republican, Democrats will tend to vote Democrats, and there's about 15% out there of undecided that are going to make the difference. A landslide in a political election is usually 5%, and that isn't a lot of difference. Also My name running is Herbert in the District Miles. 3 Senate race is Independent Herbert Miles, Senate, who feels District changes 3. in the legislature and the tax structure is the best direction for Idaho government. In the first place, the problem is the legislatures. The problem being the legislatures, it's the legislature that sets the interest rates. It's the legislature that sets the taxes. And we're going to blame the legislature for what's happened to the people of Idaho, and we're going to re bring those things down to where it's something we can live with. As a matter of fact, we will eliminate property tax, sales tax, and income taxes in the state of Idaho. We will go to a per capita tax, which is according to Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4 of the U.S. Constitution, which is a head tax, which means that every legal uh, citizen of the state of Idaho at uh, the legal voting age will be subject to a tax. And who is we? We. I'm talking about we the people because I'm running as an independent. While all three of those races are generally rated as even money at the moment, there are both Republican and Democratic strategists who will predict that their respective parties will pick up several seats in next week's election. We will know more for sure next Wednesday. Tomorrow night, we'll take a final pre-election look at the major statewide political contest with particular em emphasis on the race for governor and the state's two congressional seats. Our analysts will be reporters and editors who have covered the campaigns for their newspapers in northern and eastern Idaho, in the Magic Valley, and in the southwest. We'll see you then. I'm Mark Johnson. Good night. This program is produced by the Idaho Educational Public Broadcasting System, which is solely responsible for its content. The funding for this program is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the Friends of 4, 10, and 12.